I'm on page 13 in the new book, uh, chapter 2, Industrial Welding. Again, let's look at the chapter objectives. Um, you should be able to, when we're done with this chapter, you should be able to name the two major functions welding has in the industry, name several industries that have found welding to be an advantage, explain why welding plays an important part in manufacturing, discuss how companies save thousands of dollars by using welding for maintenance and repair, and explain why welding replaced riveting in the fabrication of pressure vessels. So that's the objective of, of this chapter. So again, we're going to have some, some key words and things that you're going to need to be highlighting as we go through here. Chances are questions will come from there. Other questions will come from just little anecdotes that I tell and, and little information that I throw out there. So highlight this first paragraph where it says, it may be said that welding has two major functions in industry. One, as a means of fabrication, and two, for maintenance and repair. That's its main purpose in life. When you're out there in the real world, you may be asked to build a pad. This is one of the tasks that you have to do in this class, 1755. Build a pad. What are you doing by building a pad? You're making that metal thicker. But by making that metal thicker, now we are repairing, we, we are repairing a piece of equipment out there and they can machine this back down and have a whole new part. Saves them a, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So maintenance and repair is one of the big things that welding does. Uh, look at all those bulleted items. All of these different uh, uh, types of manufacture have found welding advantageous. There, there's auto, aircraft, bridges, machine tools, military stuff, piping, railroad equipment. The, the book talks a little bit about all of that, but we're just going to kind of jump around on the, and, and hit the most important major ones. Um, under fabrication, so but these are some of the advantages of, of fabrication shops, and we offer a fab shop degree. Um, so welding provides greater design flexibility and lower costs, so you want to read, read over that. Uh, you can eliminate patterns with welding because this is an entirely new technology. E even though it's been around for about, oh, probably 90 years now, uh, welding is still, it has still gone a long ways to replacing riveting from, uh, uh, from the, the 1930s. If you remember, the Empire State Building was built with rivets, right? The Titanic, the unsinkable Titanic was built with rivets. Well, that was time consuming and every place they drilled a hole, that was what's called a stress riser because they took metal out of there. So welding has eliminated that and they don't have to have those patterns anymore. And it re reads here, welded designs are built directly from standard steel shapes. Since patterns are not required, this saves the cost of pattern drawings, pattern making, storage, and repairing. Um, this next one is a bullet. Lower cost of materials. Rolled steel is a stronger, stiffer, more uniform material than castings. Uh, therefore, fewer pounds are required to do an equivalent job. They still cast a lot of valves and things, cast bodies. I mean, cast steel, cast iron, you hear it all the time. Your, your, the, the, the motor in your car has a lot, got a lot of cast parts on it. But in, in, in industry, they use rolled steel for a lot of stuff. And rolled steel has directional properties. Um, it, it's what they call the X, Y, and Z directions, but I'll get into that in, in, in another class. But just know that, that rolled steel is stronger, stiffer, and it's a more uniform material than castings. That'll be on a test. And middle of that paragraph, it says, by replacing riveting, welded fabrication saves more than 35%. Um, it, but the, uh, it, well, it's still construction limits, cr uh, connecting members such as gusset plates, simplifies drafting, and cuts material costs and weight from 15 to 25 percent. Welding per permits the use of simple jigs and fixtures for speeding layouts and fabrication. Does everybody know what, what jigs and fixtures are? Anybody not know what jigs and fixtures are? Um, let's say I had to. Let's say I had to had to make this and I had to make it over and over and over again. Well, it's gonna be kinda of hard if I take all three of these pieces and I, and I set one and then set the other and set the other and then tack it all together. But if I take a flat tabletop and I put a piece of angle iron here and another one there and another one there and a little slot where I can lay down this piece of flat plate, that would be jigs and fixtures. I could lay that flat plate down there, put the other two on top of it, tack, 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 I'm done. Pick up another one, lay it in there, tack, 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 I'm done. Jigs and fixtures, speed production. 
Okay, and that's just a simple thing, uh, a simple ex a, a explanation of what some jigs and fixtures are. Your book will talk more about it, so make sure you read your book. Uh, don't try to take these tests simply from our discussion. You need to read your book because I, I only hit the highlights. To really understand it, you've got to dig a little deeper. You have to read. Uh, another advantage in fabrication shops is fewer worker hours are, are required for production. In that same paragraph, the last sentence reads, with welding and today's highly efficient, efficient fabrication methods, production is straightforward and faster. So that's one of the great advantages of, wel uh, of welding. Uh, absorption of fixed charges. Instead of purchasing parts from an outside concern, the company may make them in its own fab shop. Uh, and then finally it says minimized inventory and obsolescent charges. Inventory for welding is approximately 10% of that required for casting. So that's a savings of 90% in the cost. Uh, the standard steel parts used for welding may be purchased on short notice from any steel mill or jobber. So if I needed to buy, if I needed to buy some nipples, okay, I can just pick up the phone because they're so standard that I can just pick up the phone and call somebody and they'll ship them out. It used to be that they would, they would make their fittings out of a blank piece of pipe. And if you take well 2540, you'll learn how to make fittings out of blank pipe. But why should you have to build, why do you want to build a Y out of blank pipe when you can pick up the phone and call and order one? Why do you want to build an eccentric reducer out, out of blank pipe when you can pick up the phone and call uh, and, and just order one? Or why do you want to make 90s? Why do you want to go to all the time and expense of doing these things out of blank pipe when you can just pick up the phone and, and order standard parts. It's so much cheaper and easier to do it that way now. But that's the way they used to do it. Not anymore. Um, maintenance and repair. Uh, the addition, uh, let's see, hundreds of companies save thousands of dollars by using weldment, welding for maintenance and repair. The addition of new metal, uh, on, uh, you can use hard surfacing on worn parts. You see this a lot on earth moving equipment. They'll take hard surfacing rods and they'll build up the blades to, to, to reduce wear. Repair and replacement of broken parts. Immediate, immediate repair of welding for stalls only costly uh, interruptions in production and saves expensive replacements. Um, special needs, production of equipment, shop fixtures, and structures of many kinds can be adapted to meet particular production requirements. Um, maintenance and repair is one of the biggest things. So fabrication, maintenance and repair, those are the two big things that welding does. Now as far as industries go, we have, uh, we have the aircraft industry. We have the aircraft industry and highlight the, uh, where you have all those uh, uh, bold, those bold uh, uh, words there where it says, welding processes employed, employed in the aerospace industries include all types of fusion and solid state welding, resistance welding, RW, brazing and soldering, Aircraft welders performing manual welding operations are required to have qualification certification. So you have to be a qualified welder uh, to weld on an airplane. I don't want anybody that's not certified to, 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 to weld on the, on the wing of my airplane when I go to, go to uh, Dallas to watch the Rams and beat the Cowboys here in a couple of weeks. I want a qualified welder to make that weld. There's going to be a question coming out of there. Um, let's see. Welding is used in the fabrication of the following aircraft parts, units. They can make brackets, structural fittings, axle and landing gear parts, uh, struts, fuselage, engine bearings, on and on and on and on and on. So welding is used for all of that. Uh, let's see. It, 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 as far as the aerospace industry goes, let me tell you a little story. Um, several years ago, Jeff Brager and I both went to San Diego for the American Welding Society, and we attended a seminar there, and we had the opportunity to, to uh, visit Lockheed Martin, uh, a Lockheed Martin plant there, and that place was spotless. It was cleaner than a hospital. You could literally, really, drop your lunch and grab a spoon and eat it off the floor. It was that clean. Why? Because they built uh, fuel tanks for our rockets, okay, and they used mostly resistance welding, RW, resistance welding. They would use the spot welding where you, you saw the picture in the last chapter where the, those two prongs came down and passed an electrical current in between. That was spot welding. They used what's called resistance seam welding where they could take two pieces of metal and they would pass it through rollers like this and they would feed it through here and electricity is passing through there and they can make a long seam welded just by passing electricity through it. Resistance seam welding. They use that 
to build those, those uh, fuel tanks, and they had to be extremely cautious not to let anything get into the tanks. So they, they, had, they had a failure. One of their rockets took off, went up, got about four or seven, well, I, think he, I think he said seven minutes into the flight, and exploded. Because the time. I'm on. Smaller than a dime lost. It was left in a fuel tank, got sucked into the engines. There goes a $250 million rocket. So they have to be very careful about that kind of stuff. Um, automotive, robotic welding. Um, read about a robotic welding. Let's take the second paragraph here and it says, welding is the method of fabrication for the whole automobile. It is the joining process used to build the body, frame, structural brackets, much of the running gear, parts of the engine. Welding also is a necessary process in the service and repair of automotive equipment. There'll be a question coming out of this section uh, about automobile. Um, let me see. In fact, if you look at this, this is, a, this is a robotic welding machine. This picture is in your book on page 17 of the new book, and they're using robotic welders to weld the bodies of these parts. Most of this is gas metal arc. Uh, much of the rest of it is resistance welding, and they do it automatically. They set up an assembly line and just feed it through there. And look at that jungle of, of wires and cables and, and everything. Where's the guys? Where's the gals? Where's the workers? It's all automated. It's all set up and to be done robotically. Um, highlight the paragraph that reads, welding is used extensively in military automotive construction and in the construction of all types of vehicles. Figure 2-8 uh, shows that. Many people are not familiar with the many types of military automotive equipment since much of the equipment is of a secret nature. They use all the welding in that. Um, drop down to the last paragraph on this topic. There'll be a question coming out of here. It says, many dollars have been saved by passenger car owners and truck operators by the application of welding as a repair method. Alert mechanics who were quick to realize the utility of the process have applied it to automotive repairs of all types. Engine, engine heads, engine blocks, oil pans, cracked and broken frames, engine and body brackets, and body and fender repairs. Um, in my career, I've built up aluminum heads so they can be remachined. I've brazed cracks in engine blocks and saved the engines. Uh, just all kinds of things can be done with that. So it's very versatile. So there'll be some questions coming out of there. And then we're talking about construction machinery. Go to the paragraph that, that begins, the design of an earth-moving unit fabricated entirely by the welded method from mill-run steel plates and shapes reduce the, the weight of the total earth-moving machine from 15 to 20 percent over the conventional method of manufacturing. By welding, they were able to reduce the weight and build it faster and make it stronger. Welding is stronger than riveting. riveting every place you have a rivet, you have a weak place. There's nothing stronger in fabrication in, 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 on our planet today than a butt welded joint, okay? Um, the welded joint with fuses and edges of the part was substituted for heavy reinforcing sections involved in the other common methods of joining parts. Uh, here's a bullet. The greater strength and rigidity of rolled steel combined with the fact that a welded joint unifies the parts to produce a rigid and permanent unit, the joints of which are at least as strong as the section joined, Pave the way for more powerful tractors and for large earth-moving units. Okay, drop down to uh, the paragraph that begins, some idea of the tremendous job that is being done can be gained from the following comparisons. One giant off-highway truck is powered by a 34 horse horsepower diesel engine. When fully loaded, it holds 290 cubic yards of earth and weighs 390 tons. The design operating weight is 1,230,000 pounds. Figure 2.9 uh, shows that. The body and box beam frame are constructed of high tensile strength steel, completely fabricated by welding. Assuming that one wheelbarrow will hold 150 pounds of dirt, I don't know if I can move a 150 pound wheelbarrow of dirt, um, it would take 5,200 loads to remove the same quantity of earth. So here's, the, here's what they're talking about. This is the truck that they're talking about. I drove a, a truck similar to this in a, in a copper mine in Arizona for, for about six months one time. And mine was only a 35-ton 
uh, dump truck. You could practically fit the wood I drove into the bed of that one. And they, can't do, they couldn't do this without welding. Okay? In fact, there's a company, there's several companies that build, build these boxes uh, and build these units. And I think one of them is in Casper. I think they're called Watco if they're still going under the same name. Um, household equipment, read about household equipment. Uh, here, just know that much of the work for household equipment is done with resistance welding, uh, gas tungsten arc welding, gas metal arc welding, and brazing. Uh, those are all good um, welding processes if you're welding thin steel. Jigs and fixtures. Now, we were talking about jigs and fixtures earlier. Read about jigs and fixtures. Read, uh, there's going to be a question coming out of there. You need to have a better understanding of what jigs and figures are. And if you don't know what jigs and fixtures are, look it up. We have an internet. It wouldn't take, wouldn't take long at all to, to expand your understanding. If you can't find it, if, you, if there's anything we talk about you don't understand, it would behoove you to go and, and, and read about it and understand it. Um, you got to have to take some responsibility for your education. I can't stand up here and, and feed you the answers and expect you to learn anything. Uh, machine tools, for the manufacture of machine tools, still has certain advantages over iron. Steel is two or three times stiffer. Steel has about four times the resistance to fatigue. Uh, steel costs one quarter to one half as much. Steel is three to six times stronger in tension. There's a lot of different ways you can put it in tension. Steel can withstand heavy impacts. That would be called uh, uh, toughness. Steel is uniform and dependable. Steel can be welded without losing desirable physical properties. There's going to be some questions coming out of there. I'm not going to tell you how many. This is basically uh, uh, talking about the what's called mechanical properties, the mechanical properties of steel. So read that, understand it. Flip the page to nuclear power. Um, nuclear power depends upon the generation of large concentrated quantities of heat energy, rapid heat removal, a highly radioactive environment, and changes in the properties of radioactive materials. The heart of the process for, to generate nuclear power is the nuclear reactor vessel. Let's see if I got a picture of that. Yeah, there it is. This came out of your book. So they, they would put the, the, the nuclear reaction in, in, in this containment vessel. And what, you know, a nuclear reactor is just like a, a, a coal fired power plant. All they're really trying to do is heat water. That's all they're doing in a nuclear reactor. They're heating water, they're making steam. And it's the steam passed through pressure piping that turns a turbine that generates electricity. They can do it with coal, they can do it with natural gas, they can do it with nuclear. Uh, not, what was it, last year, last spring, or maybe it was earlier this spring, they had the, that, that earthquake off Japan and, and those nuclear power plants went down. There's a lot of concern about nuclear energy because of the possibility of, despite how rugged that tank looks, uh, it, it, it could melt if, the, if that core doesn't get, keep water flowing around it all the time. Once you start that nuclear reactor, you can't shut it off. And so they have to keep water going around it all the time. And if the pumps ever fail like they did in, 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 in Japan, even that big old vessel there, which you, you can only guess at how thick that thing is, even that can melt. And if that melts, radiation gets out. And it's because of those concerns that there have not been any new nuclear plants made in the, built in the United States in the last 20 years that I know of. Probably longer. I, I'm sure it's longer than that. They haven't mailed, made any of them because of the, that possible danger. France has a lot of them. European countries have a lot. Japan has a lot. Um, we've been too leery about, about nuclear energy. So read about nuclear en energy there. And then uh, there's going to be questions coming out of there. And then on piping. Uh, high pressure pipeline work with its headers and other fittings is a vast field in which welding has proved itself. The number of ferrous and non-ferrous alloys used in piping materials is increasing. Ferrous is, is iron, okay? So all of the mild steel that we're using, that's, that's a, those are ferrous materials. Non-ferrous materials would be aluminum, copper, gold, because they don't have any iron in them. That's why they, saw, they call them ferrous and non-ferrous. You need to know that distinction. Um, Industry requires better materials to meet the high heat and high pressure operating conditions of power plants, nuclear plants, oil refiners, chem chemical and petrochemical plants, and many other manufacturing plants where steam, air, gas, or liquids are used. The ASME people put out a code for pressure piping and a code for uh, process piping. 
So if, if you're doing chemical and, and petroleum stuff, you would, you would use the process piping one. If you're doing power piping, like in a power plant, you would use that particular code for pressure piping. Um, this is a fabricated Y. Reading from your book, it says, Y branch is fabricated for the Illinois Power Company uh, for use in hot reheat piping. These things are really, really thick. These main, main steam lines, if you look at the figure 2.18, uh, down in the lower right-hand corner of the, of the new book, that's an elbow that was made by, by casting, and it is 5 inches thick with a diameter of 26 inches. Those are main steam lines because they have to make them so thick and so strong because of the amount of heat and pressure that is in them. This is why welding is so important. You can't schlock something together uh, and, and, and just hope it doesn't fail. This is why we have codes. This is why we have construction codes. This is why you have to be a certified welder. You're not going to get to work on this stuff unless you prove that you can make a weld that is not going to fail under those service conditions. Here's another thing that I threw in there. This is figure 2.19 in your book. It says a pipe header with a, a number of branches coming in at all angles. This unit is called a mixer. And again, this you might be called upon uh, to build this. So welders don't just weld. You, you would have to lay this out, cut it out, fit it, uh, get everything approved, weld it out, and then have it inspected. You probably have to go inside there and, and do some back welding, welding from the inside, and then we're going to do UT or, or uh, uh, PT or mag particle to inspect all of those stuff, all of that stuff, and it's all got to pass code requirements that are put out by the United States uh, by API, ASME, and, and, and AWS. So don't ever, don't ever think that a welder is just, don't ever think you're going to go to work and, just, and you're just going to sit on your bucket until they have something ready for you to weld. That's not going to happen. You're going to be using a grinder, you're going to be using a torch, you're going to be using a tape measure, you're going to be laying stuff out, you're going to be building things. That's one reason I've always loved welding, because I'm always building things. Um, let's see, staying under the topic for piping, highlight where it says, with the development of welded fittings, the pipe fabricator realized the possibility of easily making any conceivable combination of sizes and shapes. Practically all overland pipeline is welded. Piping is used for the transportation, this is a bullet, piping is used for the transportation of crude petroleum and its derivatives, such as gas and gasoline, in all parts of the country. Overland welded pipe installations are both efficient and economical. Successive lengths of pipe are put together so cheaply in the field that total construction costs are materially reduced. These lines can be welded to the older lines without any difficulty. Okay, so cross-country pipeline welding, that's what they're talking about right there. There's a picture of it. This is in your book. Cross <laughs> here, here, here's an anecdote. Uh, see where this pipe's going down the, down, down the hill here and back up the hill there? Well, they call those, if you had to make that weld, say you had to make that weld right there, that would be our 6G piping position, right? Well, if, if it's flat on a flat surface like this, they call this weld a bell hole. They call it a bell hole because they excavate the dirt around it so the welders can get down there to make that weld, and it kind of just turns out to be in the shape of a bell. They call these Arkansas bell holes because there's not a, there's not a flat spot in Arkansas. So a 6G position is considered to be the, an Arkansas bell hole because everything's like that. That's a joke. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but it's true. That's what they call it. That's where the name came from. Okay, so read about that. Those guys that run their pipe, the, 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 their pipe welding machines on the backs of their trucks, this is what they do. Um, railroad equipment welding is the principal method of welding is the principal method of joining materials used by the railroad industries. Go ahead and read all of that. Drop to the drop a couple paragraphs and a highlight where it says weight is an important consideration in the design of freight cars. In an entire train load, a freight engine may be called upon to haul a string of up to 100 freight cars, whose dead weight alone amounts to 24 to 3,400 tons. Welding and alloy steel construction reduce the weight of a 50-ton boxcar from a lightweight that is empty of 48,000 pounds to 36,000 pounds. So welding by replacing riveting and, and other old outdated types of manufacturing with welding, they've got such a weight reduction uh, that, that just saves costs all over the place. Read about that. That's, that's quite a long topic there, and there's going to be a couple of questions on railroads. It's a very long topic. Um, 
Here's a picture. This is in your book. This is uh, a crew of 23 arc welders supply their own light for the photographer as they apply 100 feet of weld in a matter of minutes to the underframe of a center flow dry bulk commodities railroad car with a capacity of 5,250 cubic feet. So this is, make a note somewhere on the, in the edge of your book because this may be a question on your test. This kind of a job where you've got those, that many guys side by side by side by side by side dumping pound upon pound of weld metal into a weldment at very high amperages and very high feed rates, we call that guerrilla welding. That is guerrilla welding. It is, that, that's one of those assholes and elbow jobs where it's get in there, get it done, and get back out again. You, you, you got to make sure that you're, you're taking care of your health and that this place is, that, that if you're, you're, you're charged to work here, you want to make sure it's properly ventilated and you're properly pr protected from flash, from arc flash. Uh, I don't know how many of these guys would go home having gotten their eyes burned because of the guy welding next to them. In our welding lab, we have to use special paint on those walls. That's, that's not any paint that you go down to Walmart and buy. That's special low reflectivity paint. And it's required by AWS that we use that kind of paint just because the, the backflash that you can get coming, down, coming into your hoods and stuff. There's no such precautions there. So gorilla welding, that's, a, that's another slang term that you can, you can remember. Um, shipbuilding, bullet, the Naval Limitations Treaties of the 1920s and 30s were the impetus behind the research program that led to a new conception of welding in ship construction. See, before, during World War II, uh, uh, the navies of the world went crazy building battleships. The very first battleship was the HMS Dreadnought. It was a revolution, completely ironclad, huge, huge artillery pieces on it. And so the Germans wanted to build a bigger one. And the French wanted to build a bigger one. The United States wanted to build a bigger one. So after that war, uh, the nations of the world got, to, got together and they passed the Naval Limitations Treaty. Okay, so you want to remember that. And the reason they did was to keep, essentially to, to prevent war again, but of course it didn't work. And a lot of the navies cheated. You know, uh, uh, Japan came up with the, uh, the Yamato and, and the Mushashi, which were two, the two largest battleships ever built. But remember that name, Naval Limitations Treaties, and I'm going to continue reading. It says, under these treaties, the various nations agreed to limit not only the number of capital vessels built, but also their weight. The Navy's reaction, therefore, was to build the most highly effective ships possible by any method within the limitations of the treaty. A capital ship must be light in weight and highly maneuverable, but it must, must have adequate defensive armor, uh, gun, uh, gun power, and strength. It must be built to take, uh, take as well as to give punishment. That welded ships can take it is borne out by the story of the USS Kearney, uh, which limped into port on October 18, 1941. We weren't even at war then. This is before we joined the Second World War. This fighting ship, blasted amidships by a torpedo, came home under its own power, putting the stamp of approval on a type of construction in which, the na that, in which our Navy had been a leader for years. It is highly probable that any other type of, anything other than a welded type of ship could have reached its home. It was shot by a German torpedo, I'm pretty sure it was German, uh, before the start of the war. Because it was welded and not riveted, it managed to make it back to port. Um, Skip the next paragraph and highlight where it says, the standard specifications for Navy welding work, which cover all welding done for the Bureau of Ships, are concerned with a variety of structures, such as watertight and out, uh, oil tight longitudinals, bulkheads, tanks, turrets, assemblies, rudder cross sets, pressure vessels, and pipelines, air, steam, oil, uh, and water lines and various systems are all of homogeneous welded construction. So the, the, the Bureau of Ships is what covers that. Uh, we have shipyards all across the country. Seattle and Groton, Groton New York, or, or Groton, Connecticut are, are, are two of the biggest. And all the work, the, these are all the things that they will do uh, uh, in building those things, building the ships. And it's all, it's all covered by, by, uh, by the, the a code that is put out by the Bureau of Ships. Um, let's see. Drop down to the next paragraph, bullet. It is now possible to construct submarine hulls, hulls with a seam efficiency of 100%, as against 
efficiency of riveted holes. So now, nowadays, re re read the rest of it because it's pretty interesting. Now, I had the opportunity uh, several years ago to go on board the USS Chicago, one of our attack submarines. And it is so slick and streamlined that everything's just going to fall off of it. I mean, it's, it's more slick and streamlined than a fish. Uh, and it's all possible because of welding. Now, once we got inside, that was a different story. I looked at some of the steam lines in there, and I'm going, oh, shit, that's pretty crappy. Pardon my language. <laughs> but, uh, but that's another story. All that stuff has to pass code. It's all got to be national standards, you know. Okay, let's skip a couple more paragraphs and highlight where it says, ships differ widely in type and condition of service. They range from river barges to large cargo and passenger vessels. Um, the adoption of the construction methods used in, in, in building ocean-going Liberty ships during World War II has reduced construction time from keel laying to launching by more than 20%. During World War II, we had to have a lot of ships fabricated very quickly. They used a modular construction system and welding to build Liberty ships, which were cargo ships. In fact, there's still a few of them floating around today. And they could turn these, they could build an entire ship in as little as four days. So they just kicked them out. Remember the name Liberty Ships. You might see that on a test. Um, let's see. We're not quite there yet. Structural steel construction. Um, read that. Read all the bulleted items. And then I want to highlight on, the, on bridges. It says, bridges are constructed wholly or in part by the welding process. For over 50 years, steel bridges, both highway and railroad, have been constructed by this means. And the number of welded steel bridges is increasing. Steel bridge construction is covered by this code. This is also put out by the American Welding Society. Their main code book is the AWS D1.1 Structural Welding Code. This one is the AWS D1.5 code for covering bridge welding. If you were to take a test to, to weld on bridges, the, the, the test it, out of this book is exactly the same test that you would take out of D11. In fact, uh, it, it, they've taken it word for word. Uh, you would have to pass a test using flux cord arc welding and shielded metal arc welding, and you would have to take an unlimited thickness plate test like this, and you would have to pass a test in which you welded a vertical up weld like this and an overhead weld like this. Okay, That's one inch thick. It's a lot of welding. It takes a long time. But when we were done, we would take two little side bins, what are called side bins, and I don't have any of them in here, side bins, and we would cut those out and we would bend them. We would conduct a bend test on them. And if they passed, then, then we could write certification papers for you. Can't have, you can only have a certain amount of undercut. I've talked to some of you about the amount of undercut that's a, that, that you're allowed, but it's only a little bit of undercut. Uh, undercut is probably the worst uh, a surface discontinuity you can have because especially on a bridge because when you get an 18 wheeler going over a bridge it's going to vibrate that whole thing well any undercut is a stress riser if it if you run enough enough trucks over that eventually that weld's going to fail so you have to meet the standards set forth in this book right here okay and everything that I just told you you may see any of that on a test not just what's in your book um, Drop a couple paragraphs, highlight where it says, although cost and weight are important considerations, the strength of welded steel tips the scale in its favor. A welded butt joint is the best type of joint. Bullet. It, it has the, strength, the greatest strength and the most uniform stress distribution. The flow, of, the flow of stress in a riveted joint, however, is not uniform. It has a number of stress concentrations at various points. Uh, just the punching of a hole in a plate for the rivet causes high stresses uh, concentrations when the plate is loaded. When, the, when they talk about loaded, that means when they put weight on it. Um, so read about, read the rest of that. Drop down then to where it says industrial. Industrial and commercial buildings. Um, if you're doing industrial building, all these big high rises they, that they build all over the place, again, they use that D11 code. And you, again, you have to pass a test in flux core and shielded metal arc welding. Okay, so read about industrial buildings. There's going to be some questions out of that. Uh, let's see. Here's a, here's a picture of one of the bridges.
hearing me? <laughs> Having some technical difficulties. This, uh, this picture is in your book, and it says a welder performing SMA. Uh, a lot of times, instead of, in, instead of writing it out as SMAW, they'll drop the W because you know it's welding. SMA, shielded metal arc, okay? Shielded metal arc welding on a bridge. The deck plate will be used to support the roadway. Note the many bolted connections. Keep in mind all the welded joints and thermal cutting that went into this fabrication of the steel bridge. So, welding is just everywhere. It's what makes our modern society possible. And you can see over here on the side where, where those plates, those, those connecting plates, uh, are, are bolted on there. There's so many, uh, so many bolts in there, and every one of those had to have a hole drilled to allow that. And every one of those holes reduces the strength and concentrates the stress a little bit. Uh, read about tank and pressure vessels. Uh, tanks and pressure vessels, uh, API 1104 is, is the main cross-country pipeline code. But API also puts on puts out codes for for water storage tanks, uh, and oil refinery tanks, stuff like that. So you may get a question about uh, about that. You may, I may ask a question. Well, does API put out any kind of a code that covers storage tanks? And the answer would be yes. Uh, but also ASME ASME puts out. ASME is, is, is a 12 section code. This is section 8. ASME puts this section out to cover uh, the construction of pressure vessels. So you may get a question, what code covers the, the fabrication of pressure vessels for power plant construction or, or uh, chemical refineries? That would be section 8. So ASME puts them out. Every, every code that is out there it, it, it was produced for a specific purpose, and API did some for, for storage tanks, and ASME did some for pressure vessels. Uh, drop, drop down to the second paragraph where it says, welding replaced riveting in the fabrication of press of pressure vessels approximately 65 years ago. This improved the service performance of a pressure vessel through the elimination of two common areas of, of severe failure in riveted vessels, that is in leakage and corrosion around the rivets. If a, if a pressure vessel failed, just imagine, now you, we've got a steam line, a high pressure steam line feeding into a pressure vessel, high pressure in there, high heat, and it fails. And you're walking by on the grating outside. You can be cut in two by the steam leak, not even see the steam leak. So welding has really improved the safety of that. Um, read on the bulleted items where it says, it says, one of the leading pressure vessel manufacturers points to the following seven factors in support of welded construction. The elimination of thickness limits of about two and three quarters of an inch. Before, they could only rivet stuff together up to about two and three quarters of an inch thick. Now, I've welded on pressure vessels myself that are eight inches thick. Uh, the elimination of thickness limits for, for forge and hammering of welding. The elimination of caustic embrittlement in the riveted bo boiler drums. Uh, economy and weight through higher uh, joint efficiency, a reduction in the size to meet the same service uh, requirements, greater flexibility of design, elimination of fabrication, fabricating stresses in uh, the completed pressure vessel. Highlight this and put a bullet. To these achievements of welding and the fabrication of pressure vessels might be added increased speed of production of fabrication, reduction of corrosion for longer life, and smooth interiors of chemical and food vessels for sanitation. Blah, blah, blah. This is in your book. I think it's in your book. Yes, it's on, in the new book, it's on page 29. It says, riveted construction formerly used in, in constructing pressure vessels. Each rivet was a point of breakdown. Compare, to, compare that with today's all welded pressure vessels, like this one. That thing is so long it took three railroad cars to transport it. But there's not, look, you can see all the, the elimination of all those little holes. They, they still have some where they have, have stuff coming out of there, uh, uh, um, projections coming out, manways and, and, and such. But by welding it, it but they'll take the steel and they'll roll it, and then they'll weld it up, put the heads on the end of it. It's so much stronger and more efficient uh, uh, less stress. Um, so welding is just incredible in what it's done for, 
for everything. What it's done for our society. Uh, here again, I threw this in here. This is figure 2-37. Look how tall that pressure vessel is that that guy's on. Now this, that again is that submerged arc welding process. He's up there. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, he's using automatic gas shielded metal arc. So he's using, he's using MIG. Uh, he's using a MIG process to weld that out, not, not shielded metal arc. Um, just a, another little anecdote, uh, the, the only man I ever saw die was killed by a pressure vessel like this with a head hanging on one end and a guy doing sub arc. And because it was, only had a head on one end, it was weighted on one end, and it slowly walked off the rollers, hit the floor, it was about as big as that, hit the floor, bounced, rolled across the floor. My helper had gone to get me another bottle, uh, another cylinder of, 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 of shielding gas. And when that, when that fell, it made a huge crack. I was in the restroom at the time, and I came running out, and I saw him trip and fall, and that thing rolled over him and killed him. And it's all because the guy had only hung a head on one end and not on the other end. So even in a situation like this, always be alert uh, and always stay safe. Um, let me see. I've got one more picture here. I wanted to throw this in here because a lot of you that have taken Weld 1715 I've mentioned to you that I've seen as many as four torches hooked up to an arm so they can cut out multiple, multiple pieces. Here we have three. So this is, this is a photograph describing what I described for all of you that I helped in, in Weld 1715. So they can cut out several parts all at once. It's just a, a real handy way of doing that. Okay, let's see. Does anybody have any questions so far? I think we hit all the highlights. And again, just as in Chapter 1, some of the questions, perhaps five or more, will be coming from the chapter review questions at the end of the book. Okay? All right. Thank you for your time.